Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, <laughs> no, this is not a rock concert. I think you did not shout. It's just a classroom. So, so thank you guys for uh, having me here. I am a doctor by profession and my field of specialty is pediatric intensive care. So by that I mean I take care of really sick children. Children who have had illnesses like dengue, who have had multi-organ dysfunction, who have had heart failure, who are having breathing difficulty, who have had kidney failure, liver failure, complex heart surgeries, liver transplants, bone marrow transplants. So that's the kind of patients I take care of in my ICU. It's not, by meaning me, it's my team. Okay, so, so I, I, I am one of the team. And uh, so, so how many of you have been to hospitals so far? Almost all of you, isn't it? And, and did anybody of you get admitted in a hospital for, for some duration? And, and how many of you uh, spent time in ICUs? Oh my God. <laughs> okay, okay, so what was your operation? Appendicitis, okay, you got operated? For how long were you there? Okay, <laughs> you don't remember, that's fine. <laughs> so they gave you medicines to keep you qu calm and quiet and uh, without pain, okay. What about you, you spent time in ICU? You had dengue, okay, but you recovered without any much problems? You had some blood transfusions, going to you? Okay, fine. So, uh, so we had very few people uh, spending time in ICU. So how was your experience, did you like it? <laughs> so why why did you like it? It was a, it, because it was new. Because you got to see some <coughs> some really beautiful nurses, <laughs> or or uh, you know doctors coming in scrubs and spending time with you and poking you all the time for blood samples. Was that what gave you <laughs> joy and, and curiosity, or was it something else? New it's a new atmosphere. You like the action going on everywhere. You know people are moving in and out. There are sick uh, children coming in, going out. And, and there is action everywhere, isn't it? But then you didn't realize it was day or night because every time you were in the ICU, artificial lighting, isn't it? Okay, okay. So you were alone in the ICU, somebody was there with you? You were alone, okay, you're not scared. <laughs> okay, so you're a big boy, you're not scared. So anybody else from the girls? Anybody spent time in ICU? Okay, so, so as, 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 as students growing up and uh, children growing up and among the general public, generally the field of medical science is, has, has been driven by if our parents, brothers, sisters, either one of them is the doctor. How many of you have relatives as doctors? Oh great. And, and do you look up to them or do you say, oh God, this fellow never at home and then what a waste fellow. Do you look up to, look up to them? Anybody's parents, doctors? Quite a few, <laughs> okay, okay. So, uh, so why don't you look up to doctors? Somebody told absolutely no. Somebody told no? Why is that? No, no, I'm just, I just want to know. It's, it's, it's perfectly normal. My, my daughter. That's why just about child and rights. If you have every right to say you don't want a profession. But if it says it, why? They can't spend more time with us. They'll be with Okay, so do you know why they are busy all the time? Yeah, they are looking after somebody else, you know, so that they can, they can be with their families. So they can spend their weekends with their families. So, so doctors forgo a lot in that sense. But I am not here to, to glorify the doctor profession as such. So what I am here to do is basically open your eyes to a, to a to concept of intensive care, what exactly it means, and what is the concept of teamwork in medical profession? Because whatever we have learned and seen for so long is either from your relatives who leave home early, who return home late, who are not there for most of the social functions, who are not there on Sundays, okay? And they are doing something. And you think that they are just dispensing medicines and they are examining patients and that's about it. And why, why, why is it so, why do they have to be on the move all the time and so much away from the family? And, and then you add, the, the doctors projected in the TV serials and in the Bollywood, okay? Do, do you feel that is the right projection of, of, uh, of uh, doctors as such? Do you, you spend time in ICU? You were, you were being seen by some team of doctors all the time, isn't it? Day in and day night, okay? And, and they were there even in the middle of the night, two o'clock, three o'clock, 
people were there looking after you yeah. okay <laughs> so uh, so what what i'll try and do is basically tell you a few stories to to make you realize what i really do and then i will tell you my story as how as a student i i decided to become a doctor anybody here wants to become a doctor oh great is there any reason why you become a doctor why you want to become a doctor uh huh you like helping others okay so that's that's being empathetic being sympathetic and being having the nature to help others is is an essential prerequisite anything else i have passion for medicine that's fine you 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 have passion in terms of what it provides you an opportunity to for skills for knowledge science is that is that what what passion are you talking about okay anything else yeah <laughs> okay fine so you you want to go to rural india and you want to help people uh, there you are not bothered about how much money you earn and things like that okay i'm happy when i see others uh, okay great you so you're happy when you're seeing others recover okay so i'll tell you why i became a doctor first and foremost i hated mathematics okay so that was the reason i i chose to to choose a field or a career field where where mathematics was not there okay so i hated mathematics and and all its associated subjects like physics okay though i did well but uh, but uh, i was not scoring 99 i was scoring 90s but then that was not enough i i somehow didn't enjoy it as much okay so that was my first reason so wrong start isn't it so that's not how you do things you don't rule out some things to do something else and then why i chose to become became pediatrician mainly because i guess i was very angry as a child you know and i was very sick very often so you have somebody in your class who is always sick every class he is coughing he is sneezing he is uh, using his handkerchief all the time okay and he is he is absent 30 40 percent of the time and you are always like molly coddling him saying that oh papa he is always sick so i was one of those kids whom doctors used to run away from So as soon as with the monkey cap and big sweater, and I used to go wheezing to a hospital, hey, here he comes again. So that so that was the that was the feeling among uh, doctors when they saw me. So I was angry at the world, you know. I thought, what the hell? I'm having problems they are not able to solve, and then and and that's the frustration they have. So I so I decided I'll show them how it is done. So so with this anger and with this negative frame of mind of hating mathematics, I decided to take up medicine. so that was the starting point and much till much later in life i didn't realize what i was getting into okay because as i told all of us have that romantic sense that you're going to help people and you are going to make them get better and and you're going to uh, teach people how to take care of themselves and that's going to add value to your life okay but uh, let me tell you frankly it is it is a tough profession okay and why it is so i'll tell you so so till the current comes i'll tell you some stories then if the current comes if it all the current comes we'll go through the slides and tell you some stories so first story is of a one year old one one day old child who presented to us in the emergency of the hospital unable to breathe okay just unable to breathe he was gasping like that and we did not know what what was the problem with the child so for any child who is who is fighting for his life gasping for breath we are trained to do certain things we go in a systematic way of a b and c that means airway breathing circulation which of these vital functions are deranged which of these vital functions are dysfunctional so in the first step itself airway we thought there is a problem okay if the child has blocked nose throat windpipe he will be unable to breathe isn't it so so we do something known as intubation we put in an artificial tube into the windpipe so we opened the mouth and we were looking at it and we found that the windpipe was a pinhole size windpipe he will not be able to breathe through that because our common yours and mine windpipes will be the diameter will be as big as a 50 rupee coin 50 paisa coin okay and when you become bigger it will be as big as a 1 rupee coin so so you are able to breathe easily you are unconsciously breathing you don't even realize that you are breathing isn't it are you realizing that you are breathing okay so 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 that's but this child had a problem his airway was totally squished it was a pinhole airway okay 
So what we had to do, we had to open that airway somehow. So we opened, op split open this windpipe here and put an artificial tube so that he's able to breathe. Okay, and we let him grow. Because he was able to breathe now, the oxygen reached the lungs, oxygen reached the rest of the body, and you know oxygen is the fuel which drives your human body, isn't it? So he was able to breathe, but then he can't have all this all his life, isn't it? So we allowed him to grow, become big, reach around 10 kgs of weight. We waited for two years. And then we do what is known as airway reconstruction. We took a small part of the rib. The rib has two parts, the cartilaginous part and the bony part. So the, we took the cartilaginous part of the rib, we split open the airway, we reconstructed it so that he is able to breathe without that artificial tube called tracheostomy. Okay, and today he is, is a lovely four-year-old child who goes to school and who has a close brush with death. And he was close to hospital. He was rushed in immediately. And we had the skills, and the surgeons had the skills to do what they did. Okay, and he survived. He had no other major problems. Okay, second child. We had a 15-year-old child who, who, who came to us from faraway rural Andhra Pradesh. Very well built. Okay, very, very hatta kata, you know, uh, well-nourished and well-built uh, farmer family and then he came to our emergency uh, very completely breathless and when we put a stethoscope into his chest it was all gurgling sounds as if as if the whole lung was filled with water okay and he was he was he was not able to speak he was breathless he was answering and he, yes no like that so you realize how much, how much effortless your speech is when your breathing is normal? Okay, you realize what gift God has given you when you're normal? Okay, so this child, this child, 15 year old boy was unable to speak. He was, he was breathless. We put oxygen, he was still breathless. Okay, and the sounds kept on increasing. Then we checked his blood pressure. What do you think is the normal blood pressure? Uh -huh. 90 by 60. Okay, for a 15 year old kid, that's, that's fine. But this child had a blood pressure of 240 by 150. Is it high or low? High. So what will happen if this blood pressure is so high? He will die. Why will he die? Because every blood vessel in his body has become squeezed. It's putting intense resistance to blood flow. Which is the pump in the body? Yes, so the heart has to function against that increased resistance. So if it goes on doing that extra work, it will try and try and try. Because the body needs blood to flow through it, carrying oxygen and carrying glucose. The heart is pumping, pumping against that resistance. And if that resistance is not relieved immediately, the heart is going to fail. So it will fail, slowly, slowly it will fail. Okay, so you know there are two sides of the hearts, right and left. So the blood goes, collects and goes to the right side. From there it goes to the lungs, picks up oxygen, goes to the left and from there goes to the rest of the body. Okay, so when the, the aortic system and the blood vessels are so tight, the left side of the heart is really pushing hard and then it is tiring out and it is failing. So all the blood is got collected. He's drowning in his own blood. Okay, he's, he's about to die. So, so we had to bring down his blood pressure. We cannot bring it down very fast because the body has reset to his high blood pressures. So we'll have to bring it down slowly over a period of one week. And because his lung is flooded with so much of fluid, we will have to give him support for breathing. We'll have to put him on a machine called artificial respirator or mechanical ventilator. Have you heard of these terms? Okay. So we put in a tube in his windpipe and then we started mechanically ventilating him and then we brought down the blood pressure, the heart recovered and slowly, slowly he went home. Okay. Third example, we, we, we had a child, we had a child uh, who, was, who was just one year old and, and his liver failed. You know, for all the God's gift and uh, we have almost many organs as tutu two eyes, two hands, two legs, you know, two kidneys. But for the complexity of the function that, that the liver does, 
God has given us only one liver. It maintains blood sugar levels. It detoxifies our body. It maintains clotting function. So when you have a cut, the bleeding bleeds for some time and then it stops. So all those clotting factors are secreted by liver. Uh, uh, we removed the baby's liver because the child was not maintaining his blood sugar. He was continuously having fits and, and uh, he, he, was, uh, he was bleeding from everywhere. Okay, So we took out his liver and put a small piece of mother's liver and then two, two, uh, two months later the child went home. So, so this is the, this is the child uh, I told who had an artificial airway and uh, you can see these images. These are not normal x-rays or normal scans. These are 3D reconstruction of the whole airway. This is what science allows us to do nowadays. We can really get to the root of the problem. <coughs> so this small violet thing that you are seeing and there is a gap in between. So that is a segment where there is no airway. It is all blunted. So he was not able to breathe and we opened that up and we refashioned the whole airway. Sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. So this is the 15 year old child and when he went home he had 14 medications on him. You know, have you heard anybody taking 14 medications for blood pressure problem at 15 years of age? Okay, but children do and they land up in our ICU. So this was a child, this was another child who had come to us with basically loose motions and vomiting. And, and mother just had, had some idea about concept of ORS and she mixed the ORS and gave it to the child but she put less water and more powder. And what it did was that the whole salt levels in, his, in the baby's body became very, very high. The sodium which you call, you know salt is sodium chloride, isn't it? The so sodium usually is 135 milliequivalents per liter, but this child had a sodium of 234. So when there is so much salt in your blood, all the organs start shrinking. So the brain shrinks, so the liver shrinks, kidneys shrink, the heart shrinks, and then they become dysfunctional. So we had to do dialysis on this small child who was just one year old with that machine there and connect him to the life support systems. And, and we took out this extra salt slowly, 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 and he went home. So this is the other child that I was talking about. A two-year-old child with a liver failure and two months later after the transplant he, he, he recovered completely. So this is what medical science allows us to do today. Okay, this is what we do in our day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, tell me. Can it survive so many things and It will survive. Children are very resilient, you know, compared to adults. First thing, they can't complain, so they cry. We feel sad about it, but there are some things we need to do. So most of these, you are saying, we, we, we are not there to always poke the children and give injections like that. Okay, we give them pain relief, we anesthetize them so that they don't realize the pain they are undergoing. And then we put them into all these life support systems, a tube inside his mouth, a tube inside his stomach. There are various injections going and medicines going through that. Okay? And he has undergone a big, big surgery. Liver transplant surgery takes around 18 hours, 20 hours. Child's temperature drops to around 30 degrees. Normal temperature is 37 degrees. Okay? So we totally cool him, cool the baby down and put the new liver and make sure that the new liver survives. Because anything foreign you put in the body, the, the body will try to reject. Okay, so we put them on very strong immunosuppressive medications that predisposes them to infections, things like that. Okay, so when they are sick, they come to ICU in this shape. We have to do this to them to make them survive. And two months later, you can see that same child who, who, who never smiled in his whole life for his first one year of life because the toxic chemicals are accumulating in his body. It's irritating the brain. He's either crying or he's feeding. That's all he used to do. So he actually opened his eyes and looked around and, and smiled. Okay, so this is what medical science allows you to do in the current day. So this is what I do in my day-to-day -day life. I get up in the morning and I fight death for the small children who are there in our ICUs. For children who are extremely sick. For children for whom it's a matter of life 
and death. So one mistake from me or my team can result in death of a child, of a dear one, for the family. It's traumatic in that sense. You know, when, when we talk to parents, when we counsel parents, we have a big ICU in Narendra Diala. It was It's around 33 bedded ICU. So, so as a team lead, I have to counsel them. So I have to tell them. So first thing is, you know what questions they ask us? Is my child safe? Is my child safe? Is he going to live? Okay. Please don't worry about the money. I will get anywhere, from anywhere. Please treat him. Please make him all right. Treat him like your own child. Okay. So this is, this is the language we hear every day day after day. For last 10 years we are in the ICU, in the field of intensive care and that is what we, we, we hear every day. Every parent wishes the best for their child. And it's so easy for, for us to, to negate the contributions that parents do in our life. You know, after joining pediatrics, res my respect for my own parents has actually multiplied 100 times because I know and I see every single day the struggle the mother and the parents go through. Okay, to make him all right, to make sure that they are without pain, to make sure that, that they survive. Whatever needs to be done, they will do it for you. Okay, so that's their love. Something you want me to do? No, sir. Brightness in the Okay, okay, fine. So before understanding where we are here right now in current 21st century, modern medical science, lot of technology into medicine. Let us understand where we were. Because once we know history, we will understand to respect the, the, the duration and the sacrifices of so many people that has allowed us to come here. To this stage where I am standing here in front of you as an intensivist and I am telling you that I can save children from dangerous, deathly diseases. But it is not, I have discovered something, I have invented something. Generations of people, generations of scientists, generations of in, uh, engineers have gone behind and done what they had to do for, to allow me to do what I am able to do today. Okay. So this was what medicine was. 2000 years back, they said, okay, here, eat this root. The root has all the medicinal properties. That was the age, golden age of Ayurveda, Charkas. Sushruta, you have heard of them, okay? And then the religious people took over health. They told, okay, forget this root, pray. God is everything. God will take care of you. God will make you better. You need to pray, okay? And then in the, in the beginning of industrial revolution, when science was be, being projected as the new panacea for all else, they told, forget all this superstition. Take this oil. You know, I have made oil, I have put snake, I have crushed snake and lizards into it and have crushed with some leaves and this is the modern medicine. So take this, you, you will feel better. And then by the end, by the beginning of 20th century, they told, okay, forget this oils, take this pill. We have designed a pill, you know. And then by the end of 21st century, everything was about antibiotics. For every single illness, you received certain antibiotics. You know, we are not ready to wait. We are so busy in our lives. Normal cough, cold, normally takes five to seven days. You have medicine or you don't have medicine. Okay, but then we are there to treat because we have been trained to do so and we will give antibiotics. Okay, and then now they realize that all these antibiotics are dangerous chemicals. You know, they are starting to see the side effects of them. So, so children who took so many medicines during their childhood, unnecessary chemicals, unnecessarily treated, developed complications in the adult life. They told, okay, okay, forget these antibiotics and pills and all that. Go to Ayurvedic wellness centers, you know, massage therapy. Again, eat this root. So where we are, we are back to the same root. Okay. So nature is the best answer for everything. So, so medicine as a whole has come, has, has come a full cycle. And all the developments of modern medicine, modern critical care medicine has its origins in wars. Because whenever wars happened, soldiers got injured, okay, and they had to be put separately, and they were put in order of, of uh, the severity of the injury. The more severe ones were kept close to the, to the uh, caretaker station. Those days they didn't have nurses and things like that, 
Okay, so Florence Nightingale actually started nursing uh, just 150 years back and they started the concept of triaging, of differentiating sicker patients with non-sicker patients. Okay, so all the modern development in modern medicine has its origin in wars. So something good came out of wars. And the second most important development that happened is because of epidemics. And modern critical care owes all its development to a, the polio epidemic that happened in 1950s in Europe. Negative pressure inside our lungs, lungs, isn't it? When we breathe, we suck in air, isn't it? So these were the big machines in which they were put for two to three months. Okay, they were taken care of in this machine. There are windows to clean them. There is a mirror lying on top so that the lady could do makeup. Okay, so this was the polio epidemic that, that came in 1950s. And you know this, the whole concept of resuscitation, of, of resuscitating a, an adult with a heart attack, drowning, electric shock, all this was just very recent, 1920s to 1950s. And initially when it started, it was trained, the training was given only to the fire engine people. So if you were operating, surgeons was operating, and suddenly some, some patient's heart stopped because anesthesia was not so developed at that time. So when you went on giving painkillers, 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 he stopped breathing. So one of, the, one of the surgical team will go and call the phone and tell fire brigade, we have an emergency, the patient has stopped breathing. So the whole fire brigade van will come and four people will get down, get down and then they will go, oh patient has stopped breathing and then they will do something to, to give manual breathing and try to revive him. Most of them died. Okay, before it was known to, known to uh, common people and doctors and things like that, the initial resuscitation teams were mainly from the fire brigade. And this is what a modern ICU looks like. Swanky, you know, there are lights, there are machines, there are beeps. You ha used to be, you got used to the beeps all the time yeah. <coughs> of your heart rate and your blood pressure and it tells how, how fast you're breathing. So how did I reach here? What's my, my story? As I told why I became a doctor, the reasons were all wrong. I, I hated maths and, and I, I was angry with the world. So I decided to become a doctor and I decided to become a pediatrician. Okay, so, so my education uh, happened all over the country. My dad was in defense and, and I, I, I uh, studied in Kendra Vidyalayas. So I have told you why I became a doctor and why I became uh, a pediatrician. And why did I become an intensive care specialist? So because intensive care is, 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 is a very hard specialty. Disease has no landlord. Okay, so, so a disease cannot affect only the heart, only the liver, only the brain. So the whole paradigm of medicine where in the, in the past 50 years has shifted to super specialization or rather it is organ specializations. So you have a heart specialist, you have a brain specialist, you have a nerve specialist, you have a liver specialist, isn't it? Huh? So, so you have an organ specialized system which is not the right thing because a patient or a person is a combination of all the organs and no a single organ can get affected in isolation. You will have disease and it will affect the whole organ system. Okay, so, so if, if a neurologist says, if he call the neurologist, he will say nothing wrong with the brain, man, sort out the other things. So that's not the way medicine has to progress, isn't it? Don't you agree? Okay, so if it's if a headache, you go to a neurologist and he says, nothing wrong with the brain, I don't know why the headache is coming, you see somebody else. So he goes to a heart specialist and says, nothing wrong with your heart, man. You go check it get, it, get your liver functions tested. So there is a huge, huge gap in the way we have learnt medicine and also huge, way, huge gap in the way we are delivering healthcare. Because disease, as I told, has no landlord. There are very few diseases which affect only one organ for which you need a super specialist. Many of them will require combination of everything. Okay? And if there is a person who can manage most of these things and has got, who can step back and look at you as a person and figure out what all things are wrong with you, then won't you like it? Okay? So as intensivists, we do that job. But our job starts only when the person has become very, very sick. When, when everything has become dysfunctional. Okay? So, so intensive care again was by default because it was glamorous. It was, it was a new field. It was challenging. 
you know, you, you get to handle machines, you had a lot of technology in your hand, you are, you are a gadget freak. So people who liked machines, who liked action, who liked to sleep less, took up intensive care. So that also was by default. So I didn't choose to become an intensive care specialist because I, I thought it's, it's a very glamorous job and it's, it's, it's a very action-oriented job. You don't have to sit in the office and look at patients and prescribe medications. So I did my, my schooling in from Kendra Vidyalaya, uh, many places, mostly in Mumbai, Pune, Nagpur. Then I joined medical school in Jipmer. Uh, have you heard of Jipmer, Pondicherry? Okay, so that's one of the uh, central government institutes. Uh, it's called Jawaharlal Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education and Research. And then I did my pediatrics or child specialty in from Advanced Pediatric Center, uh, Postgraduate Institute, Chandigarh. And then I joined the field of pediatric intensive care. And then I, I, I started looking after patients like liver transplant. And once I started looking after them, I got interested because patients with liver failure are the most difficult to treat because of the many things that liver does. And then I went to King's College in London. I did my transplant ICU fellowship. I came back. I was with Narayan Rudhyalaya for seven years, looking after these sick children, not only heart diseases. I was in the general PICU, which looked after everything non-cardiac. OK, and now I have shifted out from Narayan Rudhyalaya to start my own hospital called People Tree Hospitals. OK, so that's, that's the professional part of it. Sorry. So what have I learned all these time, all these years of my experience in, in, in intensive care, in pediatric intensive care. Number one, you have no youth. Your prime time of your youth, you have spent in hospitals and you have not slept for more than three to four hours for years together. Okay, from 25 to 35 years of age, we never had any social life. I have a big family, you know, my, my grandfather married twice, he had 26 kids, we are 120 cousins. So you can imagine the, the big family that we have. And I skipped all the important social functions in my family because I was all the time in the hospital. Because can children fall sick after 5 o'clock in the evening? Okay, can they not fall sick at 3 o'clock in the midnight? Okay, so, so they don't have any timings. Sick people do not have timings. Saying that 9 to 5 office time over, I am normal now. Okay, let the doctor come tomorrow morning and then he will see me. So again, sickness and serious sickness does not have time. It can happen any time of the day. Is it not true? Okay, so, so I keep watch on children at all times of the day. So you can't do gardening and you can't grow kids at the same time because the plants need care all the time, 24 hours a day. Okay. Second thing I learned is that vision is an active process. What do you visualize? What do you see? If I show you an x-ray, if I show you a CT scan, if you do not know what to look in that, how will you know what you're searching for? What is the problem? Isn't it? So if, if you are the kind who, 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 who just looks at things and say, okay, just move to the next, then it is not for you. If you're the kind who looks at something and says, let me find out what it is there, what's there behind it, what's the effort that's taken to reach that particular painting or a scan or a film. You want to find out the cause, you want to deep dive into, into that particular problem, then critical care is for you. Because there are obviously two kinds of people, isn't it? Those who see and move, and those who look. So critical care is for those who look, who want to go and find out the deep depth of each problem. Okay? I'm sorry, it is for those who see. The, the looking ones are the ones who just pass on. Stitch and time saves nine. You've heard this proverb? Okay. So critical care by nature is preemptive. When children are sick in your ICUs, you cannot have time to react new problem comes, then you solve that problem. You have to be two steps ahead of your game. You have to anticipate that this is liver failure, this, is, this child's blood sugar may go down, he may have fits, he is also immunocompromised, he may have infections. So these kind of things can happen. Okay, so, so, so it is for those who, who, who can preempt and who can foresee problems. It is problem-oriented. 
Okay, so, so, so every child who is in the ICU, you do not make a fancy diagnosis and saying that this is the dangerous disease that you have and this is the dangerous thing that we are going to do to you. This is the dangerous surgery that we are going to do to you. Okay, so children have problems. They say if they are having headache, they are having headache. If they are having stomachache, they are having stomachache. If they are bleeding from somewhere, they are bleeding. Their blood pressure is low, their blood pressure is low. So in ICU, you do not go searching for diagnosis. You do problem solving. The child has problem, you address that problem there and then. You correct the physiology, okay? While the disease treatment takes care by itself, okay? So, so y and very, very important, teamwork. If you are not a team player, you are not cut out for this job. If you are the one who, who, who likes to work in a team, who likes to work with people, who doesn't, is not bothered who gets the credit, then this is the specialty for you. If you are the one who wants to be the star, who says everything should come to me, everybody should look at me and I should be the one, then this is not the specialty for you. Because you alone cannot manage such a complex problem. You will need help from nurses, from respiratory therapists, from physiotherapists, everyone. Okay? So teamwork is very, very critical. If you are the kind who is a cowboy, who, who likes to be the star all the time, you know, that's, this specialty is not for you. You have to understand the value of the team. There is always room for new ideas. So every advancement in the field of science, technology, every single specialty of medicine will reflect in the way you practice your intensive care. Because as an intensivist, you are always, always looking at the worst case scenario of each organ system. Brain death, heart failure, liver failure, liver kidney failure. So everything has failed and then your job starts, how to make them recover. Okay? So you have to be reading all the time and make sure that you are, you, you are, you are in touch with the cutting edge science that's there. The color of the intensive care comes from technology. It's, it's technology intensive. You have monitors, you have, you have infusion pumps, you have so many things going on in the intensive care at all times. But the personal aspect of critical care illness is very, very important as well. For, for him who was lying in the ICU for so long, alone, in the night, you know, what all were you thinking? Wow, what a place, I want to spend the rest of my life here. Did you think like that? You want to get out fast, isn't it? So you are, you are scared, you are hurt, you are in pain. Okay, so technology or the coldness of technology cannot provide you relief. You need to be caring. Okay? And that comes from within. So if the child in the ICU is having trouble, you should have the courage to get up in the middle of the night and go and see what's happening. That means leaving your family back home in, in the middle of the night, on Sundays, when you're on a party, when you're in the picnic. And as I told again, reading and preparing for, for, your, for your life career is, is an active process. You just can't read and mug up and be a doctor. You need to understand and that understanding takes time and then it's an active process. So, so just a small quiz for all of you, okay? So there are two kinds of people. Adrenophobes and adrenophiles. People who love action. You know you're going on a road and you, uh, you see somebody in, with an accident. So there are people who will say, <coughs> not my job, I think let police handle it. Why fall into the janjit? Let me go off. Isn't it? There are some who will say, stop the bike and get out and come and see what's happening. If there's something I can do, I can help. Okay, you're trained in resuscitation maneuvers and you can help the, help the patient stop bleeding. You know you have the skills and then you get into the action. Or during a fight or, or try to calm people, isn't it? So those are known as adrenophiles. So what do you think the quality in a pediatric intensivist should be? Files. So you should love action. You should love, love taking initiative, okay? You should, you should love danger. You should, if there is a problem, you should take the initiative, go solve it. It is for those people, okay? Beauty sleep versus insomniacs. So whom do you think will fill fitness? Obviously insomniacs because you can't sleep. And, and the prime time of your youth when you need to look beautiful and when you need your beauty sleep, you are in the hospital drawing bloods. 
okay and doing dangerous things bad losers versus good losers what is a good loser loser who is happy always so okay this child dies doesn't matter next child comes and then i'll take care of him you are happy icu is for people who are bad losers every single death in the icu needs to be accounted for you need to go back and find out what went wrong did we go wrong any time death should rattle you it should disturb you it should take your sleep away if you are that kind of a person who is gets disturbed by what has happened to the patient in your icu this is for you but if you think chalta hai ek gaya to agla aayega this is not for you you cannot be good losers good losing can happen in sports in life and death situation you need to be bad losers you need to go find out what went wrong and make sure that those mistakes are not repeated focused versus multitasker <laughs> so so in the icu everything is going on at the same time you know one child is having seizures then you go give him medicine then they say the blood pressure is falling then you go and find address the blood pressure then they say the person's urine output is not there then you see okay kidneys are not working then somebody calls you and says this child suddenly has fallen and has become hurt then you go and suture his this thing and then then they say that child is not breathing so imagine the complexity and 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 the direction where everything is pulling you there are problems happening all the time in the icu if you are the kind who who likes focus who says this is my end point this is the road i will take then this is not for you you should be able to multitask at all times with the same intensity with the same agility with the same intelligence so if you are a multitasker then picu intensive care is for you what about specialist versus generalist so intensive care takes part uh, takes care of children who are very sick involving all the organs so you need to know everything about everything you can't know everything about single organ so you need to be a generalist okay so you need to know everything about the brain everything about the heart everything about the liver you can't do organ specific treatment okay because the child is sick as i told disease has no landlords so you need to be a generalist status quo versus the curious so 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 which person do you think will fit in the curious one okay because you need to find out what's happening before the problem actually happens you need to read if there is something which you have not treated before you need to go back and read if the child has taken some chemical which you have not heard of then you need to go back and read you need to be curious all the time if something is not fitting in if the heart rate is too high you need to find out what's happening you can't sit and say okay let me see if he has if he has an arrest if he stop breathing then let me go and see because it's a preemptive specialty you need to avoid problems before happening so you need to be always curious and we are the kind of people who love good miracles you know in in my field of in, in my field of specialty i see many times as doctors as team of doctors we give up we tell parents we are sorry we cannot do anything your child is going to die your brother your sister is going to die because this is the maximum we can offer okay so we have we have we have offered you whatever medical science can offer and beyond this we cannot do anything and many times many of these children recover just like magic i tell parents that your child may not survive the night and next day morning i come the child is still fighting for his life he doesn't want to die he's fighting and then uh, we as doctors we we get totally encouraged and say oh my god this child is not giving up let's try some more let's not withdraw any support let's try and sometimes miracles happen so if you are the kind who believes in good miracles who believes that you can make a difference who doesn't want to give up any time of the day this is for you if you think that okay let go and if you let go very easily then this is not for you so if you want to be a real real doctor who who likes crisis management who likes 
to work in a team, who doesn't want to be a star, who is okay with not being a star, who cares about children, who gets up every day, morning, night, middle of the night, goes and sees the sick patients in the ICU, then this is the field for you. If you like a happy-go-lucky life, if you like, if you like children, if you like to have a cool life, if you want to have a social life, if you want to enjoy life, okay? So this is not the field for you because the prime time of your youth you are spending in your hospitals, taking care of sick, really sick children, okay? So is your, does your job stop there? Does your job stop, start like Indian police so after the accident has happened suddenly the jeep comes? Okay? So if there is something you feel that in your ICU children need not come, if you can put preventive practices in place in the community, in the homes, in the schools, in the apartment complex, then you should do it. Because there is no better advocate of a child's health than a good doctor. And if you feel things can be prevented, if dengue can be prevented by, by clearing the garbage that's there in your locality, in your community, you have to do it. If you can put in safety practices in place, you will have to do it. And it will carry more weightage if as a doctor you are doing it. Okay. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. And, and uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm sorry if I have scared you a little bit. But that's the purpose. I just wanted to open your eyes to the... Yes, please. <laughs> Yeah. They all say too much of start study at uh, PUC. Yep. Most children who are good at biology they will draw. Yep. Take up uh, biology at all. Because they're scared of it. And uh, I, I mean, I don't know if it's a parent pressure, so many things. I'm not going to go to details about that. So it's an addition to being a doctor. Are there any other you know, talk about team? Yeah. There are lots of other people involved in it. Correct. Correct, correct. Yes. No, I, I get your point, ma'am. Uh, yes, medicine is a tough field. You need to study all the time. Even now, I, I pick up books and I have to read one to two hours every day. Every single day. Okay. So, so if you like reading, then, then this is the field for you. And biology as such is extensive. It's vast. And as I told, the, 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 all the fields are exploding. And your fields also will explode. But apart from being a doctor, if you have taken life sciences or biology as one of the streams in your PUC, uh, as in your 11th and 12th, there are various other options. Okay? Genetics, genetic engineering, biomedical science, doing things, creating, combining medicine and engineering. Okay? You can create devices, you can create heart valves, you can create artificial bones. So that is one specialty which you can look at. Genetic engineering, because most of the things, everything that, that is thrown at us from the environment, we have to fight using our genes. And if there is some way we can engineer those genes, then, then biology comes in. Okay, so that's one field we can take up. But that's again research intensive field. Okay, you have to read, you have to, you have to do lab work, you have to be, spend long hours in your labs uh, doing things alone. Okay, so, so genetics, biomedical sciences, then anything related to health. You want, to be a, you want to be a paramedic, you want to be a good nurse, you want to be an intensive care nurse, you want to be a physiotherapist, okay? You want to rehabilitate patients who have got disability, weakness in some form. You, you, are, you are a respiratory therapist. You want to know about machines, which artificial life, life support systems, okay? So then that is the field you can take, okay? You want to be uh, on, on the field all the time. You want to transport patients, so sick patient transport. You can be in that field. Okay, so those are the health related fields which are there. And besides that, basic sciences, microbiology, you know, uh, so, so, uh, so th there you can, you can, pharmacology, these are pharmaceutical industries. You can design and discover and invent drugs. Okay, you can learn about new organisms, new superbugs that is causing problems in the hospitals, causing infections. What's the treatment options available? So that's the background work that goes on for us to allow uh, that allows us to practice what we do today in our ICUs. So there are a lot of these fields which are there, which are upcoming, which we didn't know of when we took up medicine. Okay, for us, science stream, medicine, engineering. 
If you liked maths, you go engineering. If you don't like maths, you try something else. Medicine was one of the options. And I was the lucky ones to, to survive that uh, rigors of, of being a doctor. It, it is different in a way that because in India, doctors believe that they are stars. You know, there is a star system. So you want to be a star. You don't want your patient to go to somebody else, even if you know that you cannot treat it. Even if you find that it is difficult for you to treat it. Your training is not up to the mark. In, in UK, that system is a little different. Mainly because I think it's also to do with a lot of economics. They, they pay their doctors really well and, and uh, there is a lot of litigation issues and things like that. So they keep referring. So that is an other extreme where they see, okay, I have seen, but still I have small doubt. Let me consult a specialist again. So they consult and they consult and they consult and they consult. So both systems are not great. But the concept of teamwork is definitely much, much better ingrained in the West. Okay, so a child, we, I used to see so many things, you know, bullet injuries. Huh? And then we stabilize that child and we shift to the ICU. So teamwork is better, much, much better uh, ingrained in the West, uh, that I would say. Okay? So that's the cultural difference there and here. Here everybody wants to be a star. You know, doctors like people working under them, not with them. So if, if the physiotherapist has a better option, better uh, su suggests something, or if the nurse who has spent the night with the child has, has a suggestion to give, Indian doctors usually don't take it very kindly. Okay, we, because they are, they are the ones who have seen the child the whole night. And if they are seeing something, we need to pay attention to that. So there is a hierarchical system, there is a star system in India, which, which is not good. It's not good for the patient, which is not good for the child. Yeah. Have you done any transplantations? Yeah, um, I am not a surgeon. I, I don't do transplants. I take care of them when they are very sick. Then I hand it over to surgeons in the theater. They do the transplant. They shift the child back and I make sure that the transplanted organ is received well with the, with the, with the, uh, with the child. And then, because transplant is only one technical part of plumbing job, removing something, putting some organ back, but then how the organ behaves is what I decide and I do. I don't do transplants. I take care of them before and after. What have you taken care of? Are they all successful? <laughs> okay. Uh, so we are running short of time, but I think so every, every kind of complex problems, complex heart surgeries, liver transplants, head injuries, burn injuries, dengue with multi-organ dysfunction, sepsis, everything. So the sickest of them come to me. <laughs> Any other doubts? Did you learn something new today? Yeah, yeah. Uh, suppose a person has got kidney failure with liver failure. Yeah. So how do you treat them? You cannot put both at once. But, and he's completely, the kidneys are completely about to fail both of the kidneys. So yeah, I got, I got that. <laughs> so, so he's saying if there's a multi-organ dysfunction that liver has failed, kidney has failed, is there something you can do for them? So we have to find out, is there a treatable cause for that? If there is a treatable cause, then you treat the cause and hopefully both the organs recover. If they are beyond repair, then you can do combined liver and kidney transplant. Okay, so that is one option which medical science gives you. So, so that, does it answer your question? <laughs> Anything else? So, how many of you want to become doctors after listening to me? Very few. You know, it's a tough life. And how many of you want to choose intensive care? Intensive care. <laughs> okay, there are very one or two. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Sorry, I, I.